All right, so the, uh, the reason I went into uh, Galatians chapter 6, I mean, there's so much in the book of Galatians that I wanted to preach on tonight. Um, but it talks here about, uh, you know, those who desire, um, where are we? So those who are circumcised, um, they don't keep the law, but they expect you to be circumcised and to keep the law. And this was a big problem um, that was going on certainly in the church in Galatia, but we see throughout the whole New Testament. So um, the title of the sermon is actually The Curse of the Law versus the Blessings of the Free Gift. Um, so today I'm going to be preaching on that. We'll be looking at what the law is, what the purpose of the law is. Uh, we'll be going to what the scripture says about those who are under the law. Um, the other side of the coin is, is the free gift and the blessings that come by faith. Um, so the, course, the curse is according to the flesh, but the gift is something that's according to the Spirit. So I'll get you to turn to Romans 13. Then 1 John 3, it defines sin as a transgression of the law. So then that asks the question, what is, what is the law? Um, you know, the Bible teaches it's the commandments of God. I'll read to you from Joshua chapter 8. It says, And all Israel and their elders and officers and their judges stood on the side, the ark, on that side before the priests, the Levites, which bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, as well as a stranger, as he that was born among them, half of them over against Mount Gerizim, and half of them over against Mount Ebal. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded before that they should bless the people of Israel. And afterward he read all the words of the law, the blessings and cursings, according to all that is written in the book of the law. Um, now, you'll find these blessings and cursings in Deuteronomy chapter 28. Uh, we're not going to be covering that tonight specifically, but we are going through what the curse of the law is and the blessings that are associated with faith uh, in the New Testament, um, including you know, what you receive when you receive eternal life. So in Romans chapter 13, uh, verse 8 says, O no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other, any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, and that's namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. And that knowing the time, that now it is time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, and the day is at hand, let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and put, let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, nor in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. So the reason we're able to keep the Lord in the New Testament is obviously because we've received the Holy Ghost uh, and we have that new man which is able to live without sin. Um, we'll get you to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 30. So we see that the law is summed up by two commandments. The first is to have no other gods before him, and the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. It says if you, if you keep these two, you'll fulfill the whole law. So, And I covered that in my last sermon, so we won't go into it again tonight. But we'll start in verse 10 in Deuteronomy 30. It says, If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in this book of the law, and if thou turn unto the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul. For this commandment which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, Who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, Who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very nigh unto thee, in thy mouth and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. So this is quoted in Romans chapter 10. We'll get you to turn there and we'll start in verse 1. But this is saying that, you know, the law uh, and the commandments of God were given to the nation of Israel, just as well they were given to us as well in the New Testament, um, that they're nigh unto us. Um, you know, and that's why the punishment on Israel was so severe, um, because they were given the law and yet they rejected it. Um, we'll start in verse 1 of Romans chapter 10. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, 
but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses described the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh, speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, Who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above? Or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring, Christ, uh, bring up Christ again from the dead? But what saith it, The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. So well, Moses here was teaching, as well as in the New Testament, you know, to believe on the Lord to be saved. And that is the first commandment um, that we're given. Um, even in uh, uh, when the Ten Commandments were given, it's the, the first commandment is to have no other gods before him. But what is, what's the word of faith that we preach? Uh, in verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So that's the word of faith that we preach. And that's the same word of faith that, Abraham, that, that Moses was preaching in Deuteronomy chapter 30. Um, so but right away we see the curse of the law and the blessedness of the gift. The, the curse was um, in verse 3, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness. That's the curse of the law. But the blessing of the law is that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. It's, just about, it's about believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's a stark, you know, very uh, stark contrast there between the two. So I'll read to you from Romans chapter 16 as you turn to Galatians 3. In Romans chapter 16 it says, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. So what's the purpose of the law? And we see in Romans 16, it's for the obedience of faith. It's not obedience of the law, as in to keep all the commandments. It's the obedience of faith that you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, so in Galatians 3, we'll start in verse 15. It says, Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one unto thy seed which is Christ. And this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul. So the law cannot disannul the promises given to Abraham which were actually given to the seed, which is Christ. Um, it says, For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed, which is Christ, should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediate, mediator of one, but God is one. Is then the law against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given, which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. So of course we can conclude that righteousness cannot be by the law. Um, and we just read in Romans chapter 10 about Israel establishing their own righteousness by the law and not according to faith. And this is still the religion of the Jews today. So we'll continue in verse 22. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise of faith by, of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But when faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus." And can you find one reference to keeping the law to be a child of God? You'll never find one anywhere in the New Testament or the Old Testament for that matter. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. I'll get you to turn to Romans chapter 3. We'll mostly be in Romans and Galatians tonight, so keep a bookmark or a finger there. 
I'll read to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 6, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death, written and engraved in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of con condemnation be glory, how much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory? So the purpose of the law is to teach us that we're unrighteous and that we need the righteousness of Christ. And it in no way saves you, which is made apparent in all the scriptures we'll cover tonight. But we also see in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, <coughs> excuse me, um, that there are two ministrations, the two covenants. There's one of the flesh, which is the law under condemnation, and the other is of the spirit, which is the new covenant unto righteousness through Christ. Uh, and what you see, you know, you can see why the New Testament is called the better testament, the better covenant. Um, so you should be in Romans chapter 3, we'll begin at verse 9. So what then, are we better than they? No, in no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There, there is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulchre, and with their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law saith is saith for them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So all the law does is it brings the knowledge that we're sinners, and that's the purpose, and it's clearly laid out in the New Testament Scriptures. It's to save the flesh, but not the spirit. The spirit saved through faith in the Lord, no matter what period of time you're in. So we'll continue verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Christ Jesus, of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in, Christ, in, in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. You know, so then... You know, reading through James, uh, Romans chapter 3, you, you have to conclude that you're a sinner and that you deserve to go to hell and that you're unrighteous before God. And it also shows that our sins are past having believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. So when you believe on him, all your sins are forgiven and all your sins become past. They're no longer remembered. Um, so now we know what the law is. It's the commandments of God. And we also know the purpose of the law which is to instruct us that we're all sinners in need of a saviour. So then what's the curse of the law? Now one curse is that if you're under the law, you must continue in them as long as you live. And so in James chapter 2, verse 10, it says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, Do not commit adultery, also said, Do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So even if you keep part of the law, you have to keep all of it, and it says you have to keep it all for your entire life. Um, we'll we'll uh, pick up in Romans chapter 7, verse 1. So in verse 1 it reads, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth, for if the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband, so long as he liveth, but if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. 
So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, and not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. So the law brought the knowledge of sin. Just as we saw in Galatians, in verse 6, we see that we're not under the law, according to the letter in the flesh, which is where men are condemned, but we obey the law by the Spirit which is in us. That's the new man, the new creature, who obeys all the laws of God perfectly. So we're still in Romans 7. We'll pick up in verse 8. But sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which, which is good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold unto sin. For that which I do I allow not, for what I would that I do not, but what I hate that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body, from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. So I'll get you to turn to Galatians chapter 2. But everyone who's put their trust on Jesus Christ alone is, sorry, everyone who has not put their trust in Jesus Christ alone is trusting in part or all of their works. And they're indebted to do the whole law. And it says, as long as a man liveth. So when you believe on Christ, you're dead with him and raised again in righteousness. Uh, freeing you from the curse of the law, which is for as long as you live. So we here in Christ are dead to the, to the law and it no longer condemns us. But the old man, the flesh is condemned by the law, but when we believe he died and the new man, whereby we're born again, is not condemned by the law, he's born of God. So in Galatians chapter 2, we'll pick up in verse 14. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou being a Jew livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature are not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus, Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the thing which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto Christ, live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So righteousness is of faith, and it did not come by the law. 
You know, those who have faith are dead to the law, but those who are not of faith are still under the bondage and curse of the law. Which brings me to another point where people were bringing themselves back under the bondage of the law. So we'll turn to Hebrews chapter 10, and after that we'll be back in Galatians. I believe the book of Hebrews, there's a strong emphasis on some of these Jews who were, uh, they were teaching faith plus works, trying to bring back circumcision and sacrifice into the church. And while you're turning there, I'll just read to you from Matthew 23. We're all uh, pretty familiar with this, uh, this section of, past, uh, of Scripture. But in verse 3, All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do you not after their works? For they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move with one of their fingers. Talking about the Pharisees, who are all hypocrites. And it says in verse 13, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye devour men's house, widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. So Jesus is giving a strong rebuke here to the religion of the Pharisees, you know, for not only based on their own righteousness, but also for shutting up the kingdom of heaven to those who would have believed on the Lord. So it's not only them who teach such things, but also the many false prophets proclaiming to be Christians teach the same damnable heresies. And it's the same for these fools who teach you must repent of your sins to be saved, and even for those that you cannot be carnal and be saved. So in Romans 7, which we just read, Paul's teaching against this very thing, um, and these people are not saved if they truly believe that. Uh, and they will lead others straight to hell with them. And just don't give any heed to these fools who want to bring you back under the bondage of the law. So in Hebrews chapter 10, we'll start in verse 1. It says, For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then they would have ceased to be offered, because the, the, the worshippers once purged should have no more conscience of sin. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hadst no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me, To do thy will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pl pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. I was talking about the, the old covenant and the new covenant. It says, by the, which, uh, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which he can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. So it says here that God took no pleasure in the offerings for sin according to the law because um, they were unable to cleanse even the priests who were doing them, let alone the nation of Israel. Um, but what the Father did take pleasure in is the sacrifice made by his son Jesus Christ once for all upon the cross. Pick up in verse 13. From henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled with an evil conscience, from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. So we hear some of the blessings that come as a part of the gift of eternal life and believing on the Lord. One of those is your sins and iniquities are remembered no more. Um, we have no more conscience of sin 
as we're separated from our sin, as it says in Psalm 103, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. And also note in verse 18, there's no more offering for sin as Christ paid the debt for us. So this is what I believe the book of Hebrews is emphasizing, especially in chapters 6 and 10. Um, there were some who were trying to bring back the sacrifices um, and they were being admonished for it. You know, just as there are those who try to bring you back under the bondage of the law after you're saved, teaching you to repent of your sins and be baptized and any number of, of things. So uh, are we still in Galatians 2? Otherwise, turn back to Galatians chapter 2. We'll pick up in verse 14 there. It says, but when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou being a Jew livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature are not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we are believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. We'll drop down to chapter 3. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, that ye are now made perfect by the flesh? Have ye suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you, in the, to you the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you, doeth he, be, he by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? So Paul's pleading with them here not to be fooled by those who are teaching that the works of the law play any part in salvation, trying to bring them back into bondage. And it's clear it's by faith alone. And Paul continues on in verse 6. Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness... Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham? And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which are of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as, as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So Jesus took on the curse of the law and he kept the law perfectly so that we could, through faith, would inherit the kingdom of God and have eternal life. And another blessing of the gift is eternal life, that we'll live forever and have immortality. You know, Jesus took on the curse and he gave us the blessings. And we already read this portion of scripture earlier, so jump down to chapter 4. We'll, we'll read from verse 1. Now I say that the heir... As long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all. But he is under tutors and governors, unto the time appointed of the father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them which were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts crying, Abba, Father, wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So again, another blessing is that we are heirs with the son, and we're sons of the father. Now, we're no longer a servant to sin and a servant to the law, um, but we're a son of the Most High God. And we see Paul actually going back to rebuking them <laughs> in the next verse. Um, how then, how be it then, when you knew not God, you did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto ye desire again to be in, in bondage. 
Ye observe days and months and times and years. I'm afraid of you, lest I bestowed upon you labor in vain. So he's even wondering if these guys are saved, some of them who would, you know, just, they're so eager to go back to the works of the law. It's like, are you even saved? Like, what's wrong with you? Um, verse, verse 12. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are, ye have not injured me at all. You know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. And my temptation which was in my flesh you despised, not nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where is then the blessedness you spake of? For I fear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? They zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that you might affect them. But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing, but not only when I am present with you. My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice for I stand in doubt of you. Like that's some pretty harsh words from Paul. And he's doubting these people because they're so easily led back into the bondage of the law. And it's an area that we must be careful with, especially when it comes to those of the Jewish religion, as the Bible warns us about many times or even Zionists who masquerade as Baptists or Evangelicals. Um, those, who want you, those who want you to believe you must turn or repent from your sins to be saved, or that you must be baptized to be saved or to stay saved, you know, they too want to bring you under the bondage of the law. And don't be deceived by their slick words and lying tongues. You know, Paul's giving a great warning here in the book of Galatians against these kind of people. So verse 21, Tell me, you that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai which gendereth the bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai, Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. It's talking about the physical nation of Israel um, at that time, um, which was under, you know, they were under the law because they, had, they were establishing their own righteousness and not by the righteousness of Christ. And it says, you know, Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. And that's the bride of Christ, the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, the heavenly city. Verse 27, For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we brethren as Isaac was are the children of promise. But as then, as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. So even then, you know, saying, look, the Jews are persecuting the Christians, those who have believed in Christ, just as it was in Isaac's days, the same as it is now. And it, and it hasn't even changed in 2,000 years. It says, Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. So we're not children of the bondwoman. You know, that's the unbelievers. It's the Jews and it's the other false religions. You know, Islam and all those, even the unbelievers out there, they're all the children of the bondwoman. Um, but those who are of faith are of the free woman, and we're all heirs with Christ. Um, but those who are not in Christ are in bondage and kept cast out into outer darkness. And Paul continues in Galatians chapter 5. It says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. That's the liberty and blessing we have as heirs in Christ, is that we are free and not to be entangled again with bondage. So I'll get you to turn to John chapter 8, but hold your place. We'll come back to Galatians 5. And we'll, uh, we'll start in verse 31 in John chapter 8. It says, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So at least there were, thank God, some Jews who did believe on God even some scribes and Pharisees who ended up getting saved. Um, they answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? 
Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and you do that which you have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, If you are Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This, is, this did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. And they said unto him, we be, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. So they're pointing out that they're descendants of Abraham, and some of them probably were. But we know that God has no respect for that. Um, but rather, if you're a child of the faith of Abraham, that you believed in the Lord, then are you heirs according to the promise given to Abraham. Um, verse 42, Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Now, this is the same argument Paul's making with the church in Galatia. You know, why do you hate me because I tell you the truth? You know, it's, they hate the truth. Those who are trying to bring you under the bondage of the Lord, they hate the truth that it's just by grace through faith. They despise it. They can't stand it. So which of you, verse 46, which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because you are not of God. The, um, then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that, they art a, that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and you do dishonor me. And I seek not mine own glory, there is one that seeketh and, judge, seeketh and judgeth. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my sayings, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast the devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets, and thou sayest, If a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets are dead? Whom makest thou thyself? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honoreth me, of you whom you say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar unto you. But I know him and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast seen Abraham. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Uh, then they took up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. So we'll go back to Galatians 5. But the religion of the Jews and the, all the others who will bring you under the law, they're of the devil. And Jesus is clear to rebuke them sharply for this. You know, don't listen to these people, but rather rebuke them and curse them for their teaching on the gospel. So in verse 2 of Galatians 5, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, he is a debtor to do the whole law. That's the same thing, you know. If you want to keep one part of the law, you've got to keep it all. You can't just pick and choose what you do. You can't just repent of one sin and that's enough. You've got to repent of them all or just have faith in Jesus Christ. That's the only way we can do it. We can't do it by repenting of our sins. Not one of us can. It says, Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? And it's always people coming up to hinder you. You know, you've got to watch out for these people. They can be very, very slippery sometimes um, with their words. But you need to know who they are and you need to rebuke them. So this persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. 
I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be no, none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I would they were even cut off, which trouble you. You know, Paul's got no love for these people. Um, for brethren, ye have been called in unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So the opposite of the bondage of the law is the liberty that we have in Christ. You know, and what an absolute blessing that is. And we still have some more reading to do, so, uh, but we'll be in the book of Romans from here on out, I believe. Uh, but we'll see a lot of the gifts and blessings contained in the book of Romans. Uh, so we'll start at chapter 4. <coughs> Chapter 4, verse 1. So what shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So another blessing we see is the righteousness is imputed unto us by faith. Um, verse 4, Now to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describes the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. So again, a, another blessing is our iniquities are forgiven and not imputed unto us. And he continues saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So then, who receives this blessing? Verse 9, Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it reckoned? Was it when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? was not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, faith which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe. Though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. We'll go down to verse 21. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. So verse 1 in Romans chapter 5. Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So another blessing here is we have peace with the Father. We, we could not have peace with the Father if it wasn't for Jesus Christ and us believing in him, him being the mediator for us. So it says, By whom we also have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing the tribulation worketh patience and patience experience and experience hope and hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given to us. So there's two more blessings that are mentioned here. Access to God's grace and the Holy Ghost, which we'll receive as an indwelling. It says, For we were not yet without strength. In due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more, than, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So we will receive everlasting life by faith in Jesus Christ, but also being saved from wrath, you know, not having to spend eternity in hell. Um, there are just more blessings we get through our faith in Jesus Christ. It says, For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved through his life. So we'll go down to, uh, to verse 18. 
Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so my grace through righteousness unto eternal life, by Jesus Christ our Lord. So what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Because remember, the old man dies when, when uh, we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're buried with him and raised again from the dead. That's what baptism pictures. Um, verse 7 here, sorry, verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in, the, for in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we'll just go down to verse... Uh, verse 22 and 23. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we're freed from sin and we're able to not only please God, but through the new creature we actually can walk in righteousness. Something that's impossible for those who are not of faith. Um, those who are under the curse to do the whole law, it's impossible for them to please God or to walk in righteousness. And that's the curse. It's just a never-ending treadmill of always trying, you know, always trying to please God, always trying to be righteous, and you do, it's impossible. You know, and you can only escape by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and trusting in His righteousness, not trusting in your own righteousness, which was the fault of Israel all along. And it says the wages of sin is death, and at the end of that path is the lake of fire. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, his Son. So choose wisely. Uh, Romans chapter 8, we'll start in verse 1. It says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. So how about this great blessing? There's no more condemnation. Um, John 3.18, it says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So we shall never taste of the wrath and the judgment of God in the lake of fire. And this is only achievable through the spirit of the new man, which cannot sin and is born of God. And many get this wrong about the old man and the new man. The old man, the flesh that sinned, he's dead in Christ and raised a new creature. And it's this new creature that will stand before God and he will judge him righteous. And this is why we cannot be condemned in that what we do in the flesh earns us rewards and not condemnation. So we'll keep reading in verse 3. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh, for if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. 
For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So if you have not the Spirit of Christ, then you're none of his. Um, But we have believed and received the Holy Ghost, making us sons of God. Uh, And that in itself is such a blessed gift, to not be in bondage to sin or the deeds of the law, but to be a son born free through his Spirit. Verse 15, For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So part of being the sons of God is we're also joint heirs with Christ. And we shall inherit all things and reign with him in the millennium. Verse 18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. So at the rapture, we get a new sinless body to go with the sinless new creature that we already have. Um, Then we'll be completely without sin, born of God and incorruptible, and have immortality. And if you want to read more about that, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 goes into a lot of detail about the rapture, and the new body versus the old body, putting on uh, incorruption. So I suggest reading that for yourself. So verse 24, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope that we have seen not, then do we with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us which, with groanings which cannot be uttered. And that's another blessing too, is we can pray to God anytime. We know he's going to hear us. And even if we don't know what to pray, the Holy Ghost is just going to pray for us and just tell God you know, exactly what we need. Um, and that's just a wonderful thing too. You know, if, you, if you're under the curse of the law, you have none of these things. It says, And he searcheth the hearts, knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for them, for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So again, another great promise is, you know, no man can condemn us. You know, 1 Corinthians 2.15, But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. And we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So when God's on your side, who can possibly stand against you at any time? So in conclusion, I just really want you to appreciate that the gifts and the blessings that you've received by faith in Jesus Christ. You know, we have the free gift of eternal life. Um, We have, you know, making peace with the Father, um, the gift of the Holy Ghost. You know, we have liberty in Christ. Um, We're able to fellowship with the Father and the Son. 
You know, you have the gift of your sins being remitted and remembered no more. The gift of not being condemned by God or by man. Um, the gift of working for rewards and not paying off a debt. And not to mention the millennial reign of Christ. You know, the gift of living forever with God in the new heaven and the new earth. Uh, never tasting of death and hell. Uh, never having a part in the lake of fire. You know, and also all the promises that were given in Deuteronomy chapter 28 and all the promises given to Abraham. Um, but if you're under the curse of the law, then not only do you have none of those blessings and gifts, but you must continue to keep the law as long as you live. But you'll also spend eternity in the lake of fire because you have not believed the record that God gave of his son. So I'll just read First John chapter 5. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. But he that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. And he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Let's pray.